Public Affairs Forum. I'm Jim Zarin, President of City Club, and I welcome you all, those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio or watching on cable television. Thank you for joining us for this week's Friday Forum on this, the 3rd of April, 2009. Today we will learn about the threatened extinction of half of the world's languages, and with them, the loss of the cultures they reflect. But first, I have some announcements. In consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, if you haven't already done so, please turn off your cell phones and other devices that may make noise. As always, we are pleased to welcome our Friday Forum corporate sponsors this quarter, without whose generous financial support these time-honored City Club Friday Forum luncheons would not be possible. Our corporate sponsors for this quarter are Portland General Electric, the law firm Schwabe, Williamson & Wyatt, there's a table right down here, and Northwest Natural. We thank them all for their support. And if your company or firm would like to be a Friday Forum sponsor or be a sponsor of the club's nationally acclaimed citizen-driven research program, please contact City Club staff at the back of the room or call the City Club office. Now at this time, I'd like to introduce Sue Thomas, City Club's president-elect, for a special announcement. Sue? So I have a question for you. <clears throat> it's one I've been thinking about a lot recently, and, and it is, is City Club still relevant? Are we relevant uh, in a time where information is accessible literally at our fingertips? Are we still relevant when we live in a world where the pursuit of self-interest has led our global economy, economy to the edge of collapse? And are we still relevant in an environment where people are just too busy most of the time to get involved? We, we've been asking this question of a lot of people in the last six months, and, and pretty much across the board, from members and non-members alike, what we're being told is, yes, the value that we provide to this community is as relevant as it has ever been. Now, we've also received some feedback that says perhaps our methods of uh, going about doing the work we do could be brought a little bit more into this century, and we've been given some good ideas, which I think we are, we're going to be implementing over the next couple of years relative to that. But I think the message is that, yes, it's really important that City Club is still here in this community. I strongly believe that, and I believe that uh, as we continue to see the loss of traditional sources of information and news about public issues, and as we increasingly see people becoming less and less civil to each other in the anonymity of cyberspace, I actually think City Club's role becomes that much more poignant. Um, I truly believe right now that Portland still really needs City Club. And I know, uh, being someone who spends a lot of time here in the organization, that City Club really needs all of you. And uh, as you all are probably aware, we. Uh, put out a message in the bulletin a couple weeks ago talking about the possible $35,000 budget shortfall that we're facing this year. We put out a request at that time asking for folks to contribute an additional $50. And I would really like to thank the 48 people who responded to that. Uh, it generated an additional $4,000 for us in a couple of days, which we uh, are, are greatly appreciative of. However, we've got another 31000 to go. And uh, we have, uh, among those people who donated last week, we have uh, an anonymous donor who is willing to match dollar for dollar up to $1,001 uh, the, the donations that we receive in the next few days. So I encourage you all to, uh, to join myself and, and others to continue to support the club. Uh, we have 1,300 members. All it takes is for 600 of us, out of 13 to give $50 more, or 300 of us to give $100 more, and we've filled the hole. Uh, I, I hope that you will continue to join me in supporting the really important work that we do together. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. And as an uh, indication of the relevance of the club, uh, let me zip through the kinds of activities we're going to have in just the next few weeks. Uh, there's going to be an agora discussion about the Portland plan. There's going to be a joint City Club Portland Spaces Magazine Bright Lights event at Jimmy Max about Portland's special public places like Pioneer Square. 
Uh, the Citizens Read Book Club discussion uh, is going to be reading Beauty of the City, a biography of famed Portland architect A.E. Doyle. Uh, the City Club's new Leaders Council hosts two events this month, a tour of the Port of Portland's Terminal 6, and the other a trail walk and discussion of Portland's growing trails network by Metro President David Bragdon. And next week here at City Club's Friday Forum, Michael Kaplan, Executive Director of the Cascades AIDS Project, will talk about AIDS in Portland. There's over 7,000 Oregonians who live with HIV or AIDS. More than 80% of them live in the Portland metropolitan area. So come hear a presentation regarding this important subject next week right here at Friday Forum. Now for times, dates, and details about these various City Club programs and others not mentioned, please check the City Club's bulletin or the club's website. And now to, today, to today's program. <clears throat> as we begin this 21st century, languages on our planet are becoming extinct at the rate of approximately one every two weeks. Let me re restate that. One language of a people living on this planet is becoming extinct, disappearing from use forever, every two weeks. Why is this happening? Why are the speakers of these languages not passing their native tongues on to their future generations? Or, why are the younger generations of the elders who speak these languages failing to carry on the native tongues of their forebears? And perhaps most importantly, what is the significance of this phenomenon? What is being lost other than the languages themselves? And why do those losses matter? Well, our speaker today is uniquely equipped to talk about the languages that are most at risk, how and why certain languages are disappearing rather than others, who this is affecting, why we should care, and what we can do about it. Our speaker's interest in languages of the world began at age nine when he began teaching himself, with varying degrees of success, he says, languages such as Swahili, Basque, Russian, Burmese, and Mohawk. In high school, he acquired a solid grounding in French, German, and Russian. In college, he added to this foundation by studying linguistics and comparative historical linguistics in ancient uh, German, Slavic, and various Native American languages, as well as courses in Arabic and Vietnamese. In, 18, excuse me, in 1989, 1989, he received his bachelor's degree, magna cum laude, from Harvard. Our speaker then continued his formal education at the University of Chicago where he studied numerous languages, many with native speaking teachers and through field work, eventually earning his doctorate in linguistics in 2000. He has studied literally dozens of languages in many places, such as Germany, Siberia, Turkey, Pakistan, India, Bolivia, and here in Oregon. He currently is a member of a team working in the newly emerging field of documentary linguistics, and his film, The Linguists, debuted at the 2008 Sundance Film Festival and aired recently on PBS. Since 2003, he has been the founding director uh, of Living Tongues Institute for Endangered Languages, a nonprofit organization based in Salem that uses information technology to help document languages for language endangered indigenous communities worldwide. You may have even heard him being interviewed uh, from Salem on NPR Radio's Michael Feldman show just a few weeks ago. Now on a personal note, our speaker tells me that he holds a black belt in traditional Korean martial arts. Somehow that doesn't surprise me. He also is an avid soccer player and fan. He and his younger brother attended the World Cup soccer matches in the US in 1994, in Japan in 2002, and in Germany in 2006. And he says if they win the lottery, he and his brother will attend in South Africa in 2010. Finally, he admits to being a diehard fan of the Cincinnati Reds baseball team and the Cincinnati Bengals football team, of which he says, and I quote, their miserable performances the last two decades have been major annual sources of frustration and disappointment and a main source of mockery by my friends. Uh, but he also notes that at the beginning of each season, like now in baseball, uh, he goes into what he calls, quote, full delusional, delusional mode. So I guess even brilliant linguists have their everyday problems. So please give a warm uh, City Club welcome to our speaker for the first time at this microphone, Dr. Greg Anderson. Great. Well, guilty as charged in that last uh, 
little bit of information. So um, I am definitely deluding myself about the Reds' chances this year. But I'm going to talk today about something um, not so lighthearted. Um, and this is the global language extinction crisis. And this is something that affects not only indigenous communities around the world, but also has a great impact uh, as us, as a people, as humankind, due to the tremendous amounts of knowledge that are being passed into non-existence without anyone caring, seemingly, or um, trying to do anything about it. Now, it's not quite that dire, but um, one can make those observations when um, one looks at the situation on the large scale. Um, so basically, I'm just going to try to um, give some background on language endangerment and why languages become endangered, where they're becoming endangered, what's being done about it, why does this matter, and how you or anyone else might be able to help. Um, so the structure of the talk will first be introducing what language endangerment is. Now this is actually a fairly easy uh, thing to describe. Language endangerment is when the process of transmission from one generation to the next has been disrupted. So once a language is no longer being acquired by children as their primary language, or maybe even more commonly, once that process has been rejected by children, perhaps when they enter school, uh, this is something that we call language endangerment. And th the problem with this is that once a language goes down that path, it's very difficult for it to get off that path. And it takes tremendous efforts on the part of the community to try to counter the forces that have led to those decisions. And I'll talk about what those forces are in a moment. So we can look at the world's languages and rank them on a scale uh, from healthy being a safe or healthy language like English to extinct, a language like Sumerian. So uh, in between, there are various types of less healthy or more endangered. Uh, the first category we'd call threatened. That's when you find situations are negatively conducive to the maintenance of that language long term. Once that transmission has been disrupted, we start to call this language an endangered language. And then it's just on the clock, so to speak, of how long it has left. It has left until that generation who speaks the language fluently becomes grown up, adult, elderly, and passes on. So at various stages, we can talk about a language being seriously endangered, or in the terminal phase, we call it a moribund language. So this is when uh, only a handful of elders still remain who speak the language. So, how many languages in the world are there? This is a question one commonly hears. It is very difficult to assess accurately how many languages there are. The distinction between a language and a dialect is not always straightforward, but we can roughly say about 7,000 languages are still spoken today in 2009. Now, these are not evenly distributed around the world in any sense, so roughly 4% of those languages are found in Europe and 15% in North and South America combined. 30 or so percent are found in Africa, and a full 50% of the world's languages are found in Asia, and in particular, the Pacific region. So just five countries alone account for more than one-third of the world's languages, and these countries are Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, Nigeria, India, and Cameroon. Those together have, as I said, near, nearly half, somewhere between, say, roughly 40% of the world's languages are found in those five countries alone. And just like language uh, distribution, language endangerment is also not evenly distributed around the world. So one of the things that we've attempted to find out is where are these languages that are endangered concentrated and what can we do to try to stop this process. So just to reiterate what Jim said at the beginning, half the world's languages are likely to disappear this century. And that averages out to about one every two weeks. Now, that alone is a terrifying statistic, but what that actually means is even more significant because those languages are not evenly distributed across the types of languages that exist in the world. So roughly 80 to 85% of the known language families will disappear this century. So we're talking uh, even much greater than 50% impact. And the loss of knowledge that this entails is catastrophic. The type of knowledge that are encoded in languages, which I'll give a couple of examples of in a moment, uh, are not retrievable and do not translate well frequently. So in a very real sense, they are anchored to, to the languages that, that, that encode these. So 
Of course, the impact for the field of linguistics is straightforward. It is catastrophic. Uh, the entire basis for our field of inquiry is evaporating before our very eyes. But it's not just linguists that will be impacted by this. So pretty much any person who's involved in any kind of social science research or scientific research, botanists, musicologists, zoologists, psychologists, literature specialists, poets, they all stand to lose a tremendous amount of information, and this information will simply disappear. Likely, in many cases, no matter what we do, and in some instances, we can at least do some things that will help turn the tide slightly in favor. So I don't think it's too much of an overstatement actually to say that most of what humans have ever known and will ever talk about or ever think of or ever conceive will be lost. And there's plenty of instances to support this, and I'll give some examples of this in just a moment. And this is very curious because languages are, in a very real sense, a instantiation of, of human genius and artistic achievements in many ways. So if someone said, well, let's let the Great Pyramids or the Parthenon fall down, who cares? People would be up in arms, there would be outrage. But many of these same people are either accepting or, or quietly or, in fact, covertly happy in a way that these kinds of processes that have led to languages being abandoned are happening. You know, there are explicit statements to this effect, and this happens even today in 2009. Now, where are languages concentrated that are endangered, and why is this the case? Well, we attempted to map the world's languages a few years ago at Living Tongues Institute according to three separate criteria. Now, the three criteria are at high average levels of endangerment, a low average level of documentation, so what we know about the languages, and a high endemic linguistic diversity. Uh, and this is important because there's only so many resources, so much time, and so many people that can participate in this kind of work. So we need to prioritize certain areas. And this means that not all areas are equal. So we can take a country like Zambia in Southern Africa, which has roughly 40 languages, and we can take a country like Bolivia, which also has 40 languages. All of the languages in Zambia belong to the Bantu language family, and in fact, two relatively closely related narrow subgroups. There are 18 language families spoken in Bolivia, some of which occur only there. So if one had to prioritize an area to focus on, Bolivia falls higher than Zambia simply because the impact of what's lost is so much greater. Because to any community, the language is important. To uh, broader mankind, certain languages, when they're lost, that's that window closed forever. Uh, if one of the languages in Zambia, as it turns out, Zambia maybe is a, is a false uh, um, straw man here because almost none of the languages in Zambia, thankfully, are currently endangered. Um, they, some of them are threatened, but, but Zambia has social dynamics which do not lead to language endangerment, much like we found in the areas that we call these language hotspots. And the language hotspots uh, are distributed across the world. There are roughly two dozen such language hotspots. But there are several concentrated here in the Western United States and in the Americas in general. And I'll explain why this is in just a moment. So one of these hotspots we call the North Pacific Plateau does in fact cover the area of Oregon and the Pacific Northwest. Oregon was, at the time of initial contact with the Europeans, one of the most linguistically diverse parts of the world. There were roughly 14 language families spoken in this area, uh, nine or 10 of which occurred only here in Oregon. Um, sadly, almost all of those are gone. And if they're remembered today, they're by semi-speakers or rememberers, but the last fluent speakers of, of many of these languages have now fallen silent. That does not mean that they have to remain silent forever, but without documentation, a language that falls silent is in fact gone forever. If it's never been recorded and no one remembers it, it's as if it never existed. And that's a really horrifying realization to many communities who were faced with this reality. So um, today in Oregon, there are still some languages spoken and there's a lot of great grassroots of revitalization efforts going on in virtually every community uh, with one language or another um, to varying degrees of success with various different kinds of goals. But there is a, a ray of hope here that we can see uh, where communities are fighting back. Um, so, in the modern day, 
what we've seen is a catastrophic drop-off of the languages uh, used in Oregon, but it's still not down to zero, thankfully. And there's a lot of action going on today where we're hoping to t turn the tide, so to speak, against that process. Um, now, this is a very difficult process, I will not lie. It takes a lot of effort, time, community commitment, and there's a lot of other things that pull people, uh, their distractions and, and other things that they need to focus on perhaps more than, than this very, very rigorous commitment to maintaining the language. So, you know, it, it, it has varying levels of success, but it's always rewarding uh, to the people involved when, when there is even a, a ray of success, just the slightest bit of success. One speaker being generated, a new speaker, is magnificent for a language that has none. Three speakers for a language, you know, new speakers for a language that has five is nearly doubling the number of people that know it. So it, three might not seem like a lot, but it is in the context of, of a very small speaker base. And it's certainly important for passing this information on. And what kind of information uh, I'll talk about in a sense. So what we call the language hotspots are essentially urgent action zones, areas that we need to focus on uh, resources, that is financial and personnel resources, uh, and to help support the uh, community-driven efforts that exist already in many of these areas, but for which there is no uh, financial support or often uh, these people work in obscurity, they're invisibilized, they're, they've you know, been discriminated against their entire lives and for their many generations back. So you know, there's a lot of forces they have to work against. Okay, so why do languages become endangered? This is a very common question. Uh, the most typical reason is that Language in many societies is seen as a zero-sum game. So you have two languages in competition. One is highly valued and given prestige, and correspondingly the other one is devalued and considered less prestigious. And these are dominant language community ideologies which permeate our own communities. Uh, the United States is certainly an area in which English is de facto already won, and uh, that's for people who speak English, all fine and well, and for people who immigrate to the United States, who have an immigrant uh, population back in the home country, so to speak, it's also okay if maybe their children don't learn the language, but for indigenous American languages, there isn't any other community and there isn't any other place, and therefore what's lost is lost forever and it's catastrophic to their identity. So basically what we're finding is that uh, as the languages get more and more devalued, people start making a decision to abandon them. And this may be a decision uh, that is born of uh, socioeconomic realities, uh, but it's in every case essentially been presented as a false choice. It's always been presented as an either or. And there's no sense in which people are not capable of being bilingual or multilingual. It's a natural state around the world. And it, the only reason that when two languages are in contact that one replaces the other is because there's an ideology associated with one that says language A is superior to language B. And it may be superior because it leads to socioeconomic advancement. Yes, but there's lots of instances in Africa, for example, which I just mentioned, Zambia, where you still find stable bilingualism and multilingualism, where each language is essentially functionally specialized to, for example, use in the home, use in the market, or use in the government. And they don't really compete for, for those niches. And, and in that sense, these languages can maintain a stable bilingual situation for generations. And this is what we, we've seen typically across the world. But it's not typically what we find in certain parts of the world, and one of those parts of the world includes the United States. And this is born of two basically fundamentally flawed ideals. One you might call a social Darwinism of language, that is, fittest languages spread and survive, unfit languages are subject to obsolescence, obsolescent languages are lacking in expressive capacity, therefore they're bad. So you often hear things either overtly or covertly expressed Language A is civilized, pure, uh, logical. Language B is primitive, vulgar, bastard. These are languages that are the past. Other language is the language of the future or the present. Now this is, of course, categorically absurd. There is no sense in which a language is more backwards or less backwards or less uh, usable or, or more usable in all contexts when you consider them equally, that there is no inherent weakness of any one language or another. 
There is differential status of communities, and this is internalized and eventually rejected. And why, if a people are subject to abuse and discrimination, and there's a vector they can change, that is their language, most people faced with that choice will in fact abandon that language so they can minimize the discriminatory effects of that. And, and that's just logical, normal human behavior. It's a rational choice and simply can't be condemned. However, it's a false choice that they've been offered. The other uh, ideology, if you will, which is very important in explaining where we find the most severe types of endangerment today, uh, have been born of an ideology that you might say boils down to one nation state equals one language. So in order to have a successful nation state, you have to have one language. In order to have a successful nation state, the evidence suggests you do have to have a common language. But that doesn't mean you have to have a one language. And the one language issue is where they've gone off the path and, and, and essentially have, in, have internalized a, a racialized ideology that, that is what this is inherently. Uh, it's a racialized ideology. And, and this is something that's not just happened, say, in the United States. Uh, it's, that ideology was brought by the English speakers from Great Britain, where they have been pushing out other British languages like Irish, Welsh, Manx, other languages uh, that themselves in the British Isles were subject to this. Also, uh, that same ideology was responsible for what has happened to Australian Aboriginal languages in Australia. And it's also what has caused the Hispanicization of Central and South America and the Russianization of Siberia. So this is, this is not uh, unique to Anglo uh, ideology. It is unique to a certain t interpretation of modern nation state requiring one type of language, that is, the language of the socially dominant group. Okay, now, there have been lots of ways that people have tried to justify this. If you think of the countries that I mentioned a moment ago, the five most multilingual countries in the world, they are, in fact, near the end of domestic GNP or GDP, uh, and so they are or ones in which you see the widest gaps between the haves and have-nots. India would be a classic example of how there's extreme wealth and extreme poverty. Uh, Nigeria is another classic example of a country where there's extreme wealth and extreme poverty. So, so you, people point fingers and say, see, this is what happens when you have a multilingual country. You get these kinds of socioeconomically underdeveloped uh, or very underdeveloped countries. Um, there has been a demonization of bilingualism uh, in our culture. There's a fear of, of speaking of another language. You know, this person isn't trustworthy. They have, they have questionable allegiances. They speak another language. They're hiding something. It's secret. Uh, so there have been attempts to devalue things. Oh, it's, it taxes processing. It's difficult for the brain. Uh, oh, it's too expensive to prepare these things. The, there's no one of these that is actually arguable in, in an a priori sense. Uh, the economic issue that, that people throw up, oh, it's too expensive to produce these things. We live in an age where books can be produced in cert, uh, runs of one. This is a digital age. This is, that is a pre-digital understanding of the cost of, of producing materials. And the other uh, devaluing of, of, of bilingualism uh, is empirically false. We now know that through various studies, uh, there was a long-term study that came out of Canada that show bilingualism is good for the brain in a very real sense, both physically and in terms of cognitive processing speed and all kinds of things. So there's no reason to be bad, what the, uh, to, to think bilingualism is bad. It's just that they think that somehow, as I said before, it's a zero-sum game. So you can't have one if you have the other. So that, that's why uh, we've devalued bilingualism, and, and this ideology, this one nation state, one language ideology, has led to a lot of problems. So banned languages, oppressive uh, language policies, physical abuse at times, and even worse. So um, this is something that is essentially what the language endangerment issue boils down to. It boils down to an internalization of a dominant social group's ideology about the superiority of their own language. And that dupe is dominant socially and economically, and if people want upward mobility and access to these things, then that is what they need to do, is use that language. Okay, this is true, but uh, the main problem is that 
again, it's not a zero-sum game. People were perfectly capable of being bilingual or multilingual and still dealing with the realities that, for example, in the United States, in English is the language that you need to know for socioeconomic advancement. There, it, it, but there's no reason why people can't speak English and X, Y, or Z. That, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make, is that there, it is not a zero-sum game. That, that is a false choice that they have been presented with. And their academics, for example, who clearly don't understand this issue and point the finger. Anthropologists being one group of people that say, well, language is just a manifestation of culture, culture is in flux, it doesn't really matter what the vehicle of manifesting that those social networks are, that is what particular language a community uses. So, you know, we shouldn't condemn these people, they're rational choices. Uh, the economists, well, there's a linguistic free market, uh, it should achieve, achieve an optimum state just like any other market subject to free market. Uh, values and, and um, conditions and you know look what it's done it's given people better health care it's given them better access to uh, economic advancement uh, and uh, somehow uh, language if they all share one language there's this mystical magical understanding uh, that's fostered um, well if we look at the facts we'll see that in fact today in 2009 uh, there is no sense in which Native Siberian people or Australian Aboriginal people or Native American people are better off uh, in terms of their health or their economic advancements or their integration or uh, uh, assimilation or, or acceptance within the broader community uh, in comparison to people who belong to the ethnic group associated with the dominant language. So uh, they may be better in comparison to some period in the time past, possibly, and that's arguable, uh, but there's no sense in which that those differences have been leveled and normalized simply because they chose the path of abandoning their heritage language. This is, again, a false choice that they've been presented, and they haven't seen any of the benefits that ostensibly go with this. Well, what's lost when, when languages are lost? Well, a whole host of information about the world. Most people who have lived in an environment for a long time know that environment and the things that live in it and how to interact and manipulate that environment better than someone who's just a recent comer to that environment. So, for example, often these languages will have encoded in them information that's just been discovered by Western science or yet to be discovered by Western science. So wallaby species, for example, some Australian languages differentiated uh, several ones by their type of movement, not by the way they looked. And that was rejected in the classification of wallaby until recently when they've done genetic studies and said, ah, you know what, they actually had it right. Uh, and uh, another example is the, for example, knowledge of plants and, and their names and uses. Uh, the Kalawaya people of Bolivia have an encyclopedic knowledge for some people numbering in the many thousands of, of plants that they use medicinally and in their healing rituals. And there's an incredibly small number of these actually that have been identified to date by Western science, and something along 20 or 30 percent only of the ones that they have names for. Um, they were the ones, incidentally, that knew that quinine was used against malaria and had known it for a long time until anyone bothered to ask them. So there's a lot of ways that this kind of knowledge is useful and could benefit mankind. Uh, another example of the loss of this knowledge having a detrimental effect, I can give you two anecdotal examples. One is uh, one from northeastern India where the language encoded edible, huntable versus dangerous and taboo animals by a set of prefixes they used on the words. And that knowledge has been lost. They're using Hindi words for, for these words now. And in fact, I had a, a, one elder a man um, complain to me just a few months ago, you know, these young people don't know anything anymore. You know, they don't know what's dangerous and what's good to eat. And I was like, well, why would they do that? You know, he goes out hunting with you. He's like, well, they don't know the names for these things. You know, we know we can shoot that thing, but not that thing. Uh, and that, that just sort of, in, to me, encapsulated that issue in a nutshell. Um, another example is the loss of edible plant knowledge that was common in certain Australian groups, uh, also encoded in their language that some of the young people have lost and, and no longer have this knowledge. So these are ways that, that tangibly affect individual communities. Um, another sort of more intangible problem we see in three generation shift where the grandparents say speak monolingual one language, the parental generation is shifting to the other one and the third generation is monolingual in the, in the dominant language. Uh, this is a significant cause of stress in these communities for the elders who, who find these, 
situation to be untenable and, and very stressful, but are in a position where they can't do anything about it. So the economic argument and, and the magical argument that people make that somehow sharing a language fosters understanding and a mutual understanding and, and everyone gets along would mean that, well, you could never have a civil war in a country that people spoke the same language uh, because there's magically they would understand and not go to war if they spoke the same language. And divorce rates in the United States would suggest that mutual understanding is not a byproduct of sharing the same language. Uh, so there is absolutely no reason to assume that, that there's any kind of magical pixie dust we can spread on, on a community just because they share a same language. Okay, so just to reiterate, this is my assertion that linguistic diversity is as important as biodiversity. In a very real sense, linguistic diversity is human ecology. And ecology, as we know, ecosystems require diversity to be healthy. So, and it's very short-sighted for English speakers to think that the run of English will, will continue forever into history. Uh, Sumerian was a dominant language. They got replaced by the Akkadians. The Akkadian was a dominant language they're also extinct. Uh, let's, let's not kid ourselves. There's no language that survived through history, through time, forever. The, t the run of English will end eventually. And if everyone is comfortable here with being told that someday they must speak Yoruba or, or Greenlandic Eskimo or Chinese, and that's fine because that's the, the dominant language and you better like it, uh, then I'm, you're comfortable with that, then I'm comfortable with you being comfortable with that, although I'm not personally comfortable with that. Uh, so um, I should reiterate, however, that this is not a guilt complex which motivates linguists like myself, uh, although this is a, a view that persists even today. There was a uh, professor from University of Washington quoted in the Washington Post just a couple of weeks ago saying, uh, let's see, when we have indigenous languages in danger because of what we've done to these communities, that's the real reason behind preservation pushes, he said. It doesn't mean every language now has the right to be immortal. Well, I disagree with this, of course, categorically. And I think it is a fundamentally flawed understanding of what would motivate a, a language scientist to want to preserve these languages. It is the very essence of our field, and we will learn very little about the nature of language when we only have 20 different versions of English and French and Chinese to, to worry about, uh, rather than all of the rich diversity that, for example, used to exist here in Oregon. Okay, so who's, who's doing this and, and, and for what? So there's two communities that you have to address when you're working with language preservation, documentation, and maintenance. Obviously, the first one is the speech community, the, the minority language community itself. And the second community would be the community of scientists. And these are very different groups with very different goals and needs. So it is very difficult, in fact, to find ways to find something that can be useful or appreciated for both sets of users, because it's denying reality to think that one or the other wouldn't benefit from, from any number of products. So this is something that we attempt to do in our own work. Uh, we take our guide from, that is the Living Tongues Institute, uh, for endangered languages. We take our guidance from communities, we work directly with them and produce whatever it is that they would like to produce to be used by their own community for language revitalization efforts. So this includes ABC books, children's readers, online um, tools, talking dictionaries is a common one that we like to do that's very popular with people because it's fun to play with. And you, if you're immobile, for example, elders who are no longer capable of going to community centers or things, uh, they, they still ha can have access to these things in their home. Uh, and linguists, of course, want very different kinds of products, very different kinds of scientifically grounded and, and inaccessible products, and we do produce those things as well. But that's something that we usually produce on our own time rather than with working with the communities because that's not what they need. So we kind of try to straddle this uh, balance. It's not very, not very easy, I must admit, but it isn't too hard if you can compartmentalize those things and understand that they aren't the same. And that's led to some misunderstandings and, and uh, some resentment uh, um, in certain indigenous communities around the world about linguists, you know, they're just, they're, they're getting money off our language or whatever, this kind of thing. And, and, and you can't really blame the linguists because universities don't tenure you for producing ABC books and things. So they, they, have, they have issues, they have, to, you know, they have to feed their families and they have realities they have to deal with. So there's just some lack of communication there. Okay, so I mentioned that we're doing this. First and foremost, it's, it's grassroots community efforts. That's really where this stuff is going on and that's who we attempt to support. And uh, 
how can I help is a question frequently heard. Well, uh, of course, supporting organizations like Living Tongues is a, is a good way if you want to contribute financially to helping people who are doing this work. Uh, and if you have certain kinds of skills, you can volunteer uh, those skills. That could be uh, computing skills, accounting skills, any number of different kinds of skills. It doesn't have to be linguistic training. Of course, if you have linguistic training, that helps and that would be useful. And there's are certain other kinds of things you could do in that way. If you're young or energetic enough, get those skills. There's no way to, to shortcut that, I won't lie. There are some really kind of drudgery type classes that you're going to have to get through because a field linguist has to be able to do anything. You know, you have to be able to do with sounds and sentences and paradigms and poetics. You know, you, you got to be able to deal with it, whatever information you've got coming to you on the fly. So you have to have some basic grounding in basic linguistics of a broad spectrum. Uh, Portland State has a nice uh, introductory program in linguistics as does University of Oregon. So, you know, there are places available here in Oregon where you can get this kind of training. And, uh, and then, you know, if you have a connection with the community, certainly um, raising awareness is extremely important. These people often uh, are fighting their fight in, in very difficult circumstances, uh, invisibilized, no one's listening, no one cares. So just raising public awareness and talking to your friends about it and getting people to understand that people have the right to speak the language that they choose. And all things being equal, people choose to maintain their heritage identity and do not choose to assimilate. So. Just to conclude, I'd like to say that the global language extinction is something that's very real, and it's a, a, an issue that is facing many, many communities right now, and it's something that we need to act on now. This is not something that can wait 20 or 50 years for most communities. This is something that has to be done now. And what will be lost is the vast majority of our collected, accrued knowledge that has been passed down for millennia from generation to generation, and that process is stopping now. Thank you. The first question for our speaker, as always, will be from our Board of Governors host. Our board host today is Leslie Moorhead. Leslie Moorhead is a consultant providing financial management services for small businesses. Uh, she told me coyly that she's been a member of City Club for a very long time. Uh, she served five years on the club's research board, receives the club, received the club's research award in 2007. She is the Board of Governors liaison to the Agri Committee, and she serves as the club's uh, chair of the club's governance task force. She's been a member of the Board of Governors since last year. Leslie? Thank you, Jim. Greg, I'd like to have you give us a short um, succinct dis uh, dissertation on the origin of languages. Uh, what causes a language to s be created? Back at the beginning of time, I guess. Why do we have so many languages? And do you know of or can you imagine any circumstances in our current day that would be conducive to a new language springing up? Thank you. Um, well, the origin, uh, that was a very complex question. Uh, the origin of language is a contentious issue. Uh, how and why humans developed language is something, um, and what it is actually that constitutes a language. Like at what point did proto-humanoid communication system cross over into language is an issue that I think maybe developmental biologists or something might have to handle. Now, once languages exist, how do they develop? That's, that's, that's more easy to answer. Uh, languages always change over time, naturally. Uh, all languages essentially are a, an a accommodation across social networks uh, of individuals who have agreed upon tacitly to use the more or less same sounds in the same sequence to mean the same things. And uh, these kinds of individual choices over time uh, accrue changes. Uh, probably up until, uh, say, 10,000 years ago and the beginning of agriculture, the norm was to have lots of little languages, each in essentially maybe extended family groups or something. And over time, as agriculture allowed larger networks of communication, uh, that is broader or less dense networks of communication to form, uh, 
more and more people were brought into those same communication networks, so that allowed the rise of certain large languages to develop. In, in certain parts of the world today, like New Guinea, in certain parts of New Guinea, you still see the kind of older situation where most of the languages are very small and spoken by only a few hundred people at most, uh, some cases even under 100. But that, that's probably what, if you projected back, the world was like, say, 12,000 years ago or something before agriculture started in earnest uh, and other languages started spreading. So the, the best known language family in terms of its spread would be the Indo-European language family. And we know that there was probably out migrations by different groups that then cut themselves off. And then that's why Germanic is different than Romance and different than Slavic now. But they were originally the same language uh, some 5,000 or more years ago. Um, what was the second part of the question? Any languages, yes. Um, there have been. Uh, New languages are actually emerging, and uh, you know, just taking English as an example, there's lots of new Englishes that have emerged in the past few hundred years, largely through uh, contact with other languages. The development of pidgin and creole languages is something that's um, generated a, a range of new languages. And this is another thing that people point to. Well, see, we have all these new languages coming in. That will balance out the ones we're losing. But no matter how many varieties of English you have, it's still a kind of English. Uh, and in terms of the types of, of phenomena that you'll see, the diversity of, of structures and cognitive structures and communicative structures that people have chosen to speak about is still going to be fairly narrow compared to what's being lost today. So it's never going to replace even if it replaces in total number, it's never going to replace the diversity, which is one of the reasons why we focused on this diversity aspect in our language hotspots model. Now is the time in our program where we uh, open up to questions from the floor. Uh, questions at Friday Forums are a privilege of City Club membership. Uh, we ask you to ask your question in 30 seconds or less. Remember that your question ends in a question mark and uh, we'll go until 1.15 and I just want to say if anybody's ever talked to uh, real high-tech people lately about computers and things it seems like we may have new languages there at least it just seems that way to me. Paddy Tillett, City Club member. You speak about different language groups and one supposes that those groups have developed over a very long time and so they have they've probably developed um, their own mythologies, traditions, uh, creation stories, for example, different enormously. I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about the extent to which those things do differ. You mentioned the, the use of botanicals in Bolivia, for example, but I suspect there are a great many things that distinguish different language groups, and I'd love to hear you comment on that. Okay, great. Uh, the question was, how do languages differ in a tangible way one from another? Well, uh, some of the more classic ways that languages would differ are, for example, the order that meaningful elements occur. So subject, verb, object is the order that we use in English. So John hit Bill is not Bill hit John. Uh, you know who the subject is and who the object is because one comes before the verb and one comes after the verb. Languages like Turkish or Japanese have the order of subject object verb, so the verb comes at the end. Classical Arabic was verb, subject, object. And then the other orders, all, all six possible orders occur. The ones that have objects before subjects occur only essentially in a small number of languages from uh, northern South America and randomly in a few other ones. And it was thought to not exist until these languages were in fact documented. So this is a way in which documenting languages shows that we don't really know everything we think we know about languages because this was predicted in print to not be possible until then of course we got more data and it was possible. Another way would be noun classes. Everyone may have taken French or Spanish or something and know that you struggle with some nouns being el or la or le or la and you know why is table masculine in German but is it it's feminine in French, you know, just you cross the border and suddenly it goes from feminine to masculine. It's an arbitrary class and there is some basis in real world in that men are men, in the masculine and feminine females are fe feminine, but um, lots of languages divide up the world into more fine-grained classes, so uh, three uh, classes, four classes, uh, Bantu languages make use of 15 classes typically, so uh, this is a way in which they've decided that a fine-grained distinction is not fine-grained enough unless you have 15 different categories, not two or three. Dave Weber, City Club member. Um, how good an approximation to 
an actual living human being would other means of preserving a language be? And I ask that because it seems like in some cases the living human being who carries on a language is pretty alienated from the real context of that language and living in the, a different culture than the actual uh, people who owned the heritage lived in. And so the, the knowledge of the, that's embedded in the language would be kind of uh, tenuously held by the speaker. And it seems like if you had grammars and dictionaries and um, audio preservation, you could, you could maybe even capture more than you could with an actual living speaker. Well, um, hmm, that's a kind of interesting question. Uh, I think that you have, of course, individuals who are particularly adept at certain kinds of information and dissemination of certain kinds of information. You have virtuoso st storytellers, you have people that have a particularly good knowledge of the use of plants in an area, or you have uh, you know, people who are good singers, for example, and compose verse uh, in a particular language in an expert, recognizably expert manner. Um, I, I don't think, uh, once you have a removal from a interactive communicative context, then a lot, of course, is lost in language. There's only so much you can learn from looking at a book. I mean, recordings, of course, are better than not having a sound recording simply because you'll know what the word sounds like. And you, anyone who's tried to, you know, look at English or any other language, you know, it's not necessarily intuitive how a word is pronounced by, by even if you know the spelling rules that, well, you know, like, for example, English, why is the present tense of read, read, uh, and why is the past tense pronounced red but spelled the same way, okay? I mean, there's, there's all kinds of weird things that happen in, in when you, con you know, read and read, they're spelled the same way, but we both have read and read written different ways and mean different things. So, you know, there's lots to be confused about in, in terms of uh, recording uh, on paper. Sound recordings give you a better indication of what a language is like, but uh, I, I'm not, sure you'll ever be able to acquire uh, the sort of deep knowledge that a person would have, especially an elder who's spoken a language for their whole life, uh, from no matter how many hours you studied books or, or recordings of the language, it, you, you still wouldn't get the kind of rich, nuanced understanding of, of the connotation of words and things that those people would have. So you can't really replace that, I don't think. Hi, my name is Milt Markowitz and I'm a City Club member and um, I'd like to ask you about different types of languages, um, particularly distinguishing between those that are symbolic or characters and those that are alphabetic or word. Um, in your talk, you talked a lot about knowledge and data and when I think of those languages that are uh, more symbolic, they're more wisdom languages, wisdom cultures and what's lost in their languages when they move to an alphabetic, the mechanical, you know, subject, object, subject, verb, object type thing. So I just wonder if you'd comment on what's lost uh, when we've moved away from the ancient Hebrew or Sanskrit or Chinese uh, to uh, alphabetic languages. Okay, well, um, yeah, those are all very, four different kinds of languages that you just mentioned, Hebrew, Chinese, Sanskrit, and say, English being an alphabetic language. Um, I, you need to, yes, there is a psychological reality that a particular writing system does have for people that are literate in that writing system, which has some kind of effect if they need to change that. Uh, but, and which is why Chinese maintains its character system, even though it's cumbersome, because the characters are the same across all the Chinese languages. We talk of Chinese dialects, but there's no sense in which Mandarin and Cantonese are dialects of the same language. They're not mutually intelligible. They're at least as different as Italian and Portuguese are, and that's, no one has a problem calling those two different languages, but Cantonese and Mandarin they call dialects, and so, but the writing system is shared. So there's a certain kind of nation state ideology there that helps the writing system be maintained even though it's cumbersome for contemporary computing issues among other things as far as I understand although I'm outside of my area of expertise here I must admit. Um, alphabetic systems like English is an abstraction because you actually don't make sounds individually like you can't make a sound like T without a vowel you know you can't even say the word T it's T 
tuh, even tuh has an uh, okay? So they're, they're syllabic systems like you find in Sanskrit, for example, syllabary systems, which is sort of quasi-alphabetic or quasi-syllabic. Uh, that's something where it's at least closer to the reality that things are encoded in a syllable. That's the sort of minimum unit of speech is a syllable. Uh, and um, the Arabic and Hebrew systems is a very interesting system born of the particular nature of those languages. They're, they write the consonantal roots that exist and the vowels and everything else are what, where you get the grammar, just boiling it down and oversimplifying a little bit. That's the way Semitic languages work. They have a consonantal roots and then they have other things that mark the grammar. Uh, so rather than having a root like red, they, they, they have a, or read or write, kataba in Arabic, you know, it's KTB. Kutub, kitab, that's books and book. And yaktubu, he's writing. Okay, so the KTB always stays in the same order. So that's, it makes sense from a Semitic perspective why they would choose only to write consonants. Um, it doesn't make sense to apply to other languages, which is why the Arabic alphabet is so hideously unsuited to, to many other languages for which it's uh, been co-opted as the writing system. Now, loss of, of these things, I mean, the, li the language is, is the, uh, the, how you render a system is, is almost an arbitrary choice, I think, because uh, Chinese is equally well suited to be written as, with syllabic writing or alphabetic writing as it is to be written in, in character writing. It's just that's not the tradition that they've chosen uh, to maintain. Uh, so there may be things that are lost there. Again, that might be some in the domain of, say, a literary specialist uh, or uh, somewhat a literacy specialist, something outside of my area of expertise, but I, I think that um, you know, there's probably some psychological reality that exists there for, for people who use these, but in an abstract sense, uh, the actual language itself being lost is, is a greater evil, if you will, than, than, than losing of a particular writing system. One of the ways the language becomes in danger is that it loses its currency in the marketplace. In Oklahoma, you can use Cherokee to do a bank transaction, but you can't use Kalapuya to do a bank transaction. Perhaps the most famous Kalapuya word we're aware of is Tualatin. How can these languages be assigned some type of commercial value to try to help keep them vibrant? That's an excellent question. Um, yes, how do we attempt to raise the status of languages that have already been devalued in the linguistic market? Uh, so that they have some modernity, some contemporary relevance. Uh, and they, that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, one of the things that one can try to do is to incentivize the use of the language. Perhaps there, is, there are educational or uh, employment opportunities specifically tied to the use of that language. That would be a, re a way to incentivize a young person uh, to use uh, the language. Now, one of the things we've found in our work um, in various places outside of the United States, uh, where people tend to be a little jaded towards any kind of technology anymore, uh, is using modern technology to uh, record these languages is considered outrageously interesting to the young people in some of these communities. That's exactly how we've lured several people into working with the language community, the language uh, department in some of these uh, communities by having uh, recorders or video recorders, people love the video cameras in particular. And we get, if they show any interest in it, we'll get them behind the camera. We'll we, we do training in technology, so we, we get them to learn how to use these things. So you demystify it, and then you see, see this language still is relevant, even with this very modern high-tech thing. It still is something that's relevant. So don't think of the language as being something that's tied to the past. That's the attitude that's associated with it. That's not the reality. The reality is that any language is potentially equally usable in any context. Now, you are correct that Kalapuya is not going to be used as a language of bank transaction, uh, largely because the speakers of Kalapuya, there are no fluent speakers of Kalapuya left, as far as I know. The language is, was reported extinct the last variety of Kalapuya reported extinct in the 1960s and the other ones in the 1930s and even 1915 for the Amil. So that's not a, uh, that's a long time ago at this point and so the language is, is, is deeply asleep, if you will. Uh, so awakening it will be more difficult than it would be a language like Cherokee, which still has a large speaker base and has been promoted and enfranchised through various programs already in place for a while now at this point. 
Uh, and they were also very tied to their identity in a way that um, many Kalapuya people didn't feel they had the opportunity or ability to be so when that mattered. And that's one of the reasons why, and of course the fact that they were split up and put in different reservations where need for a common language necessitated not the use of Kalapuya but say Chinook jargon. Okay, so that, that's just the reality that they faced. You mentioned that there are two main groups involved in language revitalization and maintenance, the speech community and the scientist community. How is the education community involved now? And ideally, how should the education community be involved in the future? Well, they could be either one. They could be in the science community or they could be essentially advocates for the speech community through getting the language spoken or um, taught as a school language. Um, uh, we've been working with the Confederated Tribes of Siletz and they have a charter school down in Siletz where they've been attempting to use the language in various, I think sixth, seventh, and eighth grade classes right now. The, the desire is to get a full curriculum. So they're doing curriculum development and educators have a great role to play there. Uh, getting less restrictive laws applied uh, would be something that educators could help um, advocate and, and be lobbyists for and, and help get on. Uh, having restrictive la language legislation is insane because it's a total waste of time. It's, it's, it's an absolute, it's already done basically. The linguistic market has, has dictated that English has won on the sort of trans state uh, intergroup language level. Uh, it's the other levels that languages can, can function in, the home language or even a schooling language. Uh, that uh, they still have opportunities to be used in. Uh, and there's no need to put in place anything that promotes English because it's already essentially a fait accompli. It's already won. So any, any legislation that supports it already having won is, is a total waste of time and money. Um, but educators, I think, have a very important role uh, in, in, in helping uh, develop curricula that are maintainable and will accept, uh, be accepted by state guidelines and whatnot, so uh, there, yeah, I, I was remiss in, in excluding them. We have run out of time, so we'll have to stop there. Uh, join us at next week's Friday Forum for a presentation by Michael Kaplan of the Cascades Aid Project. Remember that we have our spring membership drive uh, in place. If you value these kinds of Friday Forums, one very good way to help the club maintain our budget and these kinds of programs is to become a member and renew. And as we close, please uh, join me in expressing our appreciation for today's speaker. Uh, one of the things I think about with these Friday forums is whether or not people who leave here are going to probably never think about an issue the same again. And my guess is that's the case today. So uh, please join me in thanking Greg Anderson. Thank you. We are adjourned.